Dear congregation, I'd like to first read our text from Hebrews 2, verses 17 through 18, and then turn to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and we'll read the first 11 verses. And so we read the context of our passage this morning from Hebrews chapter 2. I'd like to just read and limit ourselves to our text from verse 17 through 18, and then turn to Matthew chapter 4. Let us hear God's word, Hebrews 2, 17 through 18. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself also has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, we see the real temptations of our Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the, of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, Angels came and ministered to him. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I think uh, our children can even identify with the reality of being sick, uh, being weak, feeling broken, feeling down and out, and you snuggle up next to your mom or your dad, and you feel comfortable. Why do you feel comfortable? What kind of comfort do you receive from them? Well, your mom or your dad, they're, they're merciful and gracious. They care about you. They're probably praying for you. They're pointing you to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're faithful in teaching you and giving you comfort. This is the kind of comfort we want to speak about today from our text, Hebrews chapter 2, the comfort of Christ's incarnation. It's the fact that He's a merciful and faithful high priest. What kind of comfort can we receive that from that? We'll see that in three points. The comfort that comes from him being our merciful and faithful high priest is because he is like his brethren. Secondly, he is for his brethren. And thirdly, he is with his brethren. When we talk about brethren, that means children, boys and girls, middle-aged people, older people, any any person who puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, any nationality, any age, any gender, he is a merciful 
and faithful high priest because he is like his brethren. Sometimes when we look at Scripture, we look at who God is and consider who God is, we wonder, can God identify with us? Because He is God, and He's a spirit, and we are flesh. Can, can God really identify with us in our daily struggles as creatures here below? Sometimes we might even have that in our relationships. As children, we might think, my parents don't really understand what I'm going through as a young boy, young girl, a, a teenager. They don't really understand because life must be way different for me than when they were young. Or maybe you think, I would like to share my burdens and challenges with my pastor, but, you know, my pastor, you know, I only see him in his suit on Sunday. He seems to have it all together. How could I ever open up to him? Or maybe you think, I could probably share it with some other friend in the congregation, but you know, every time I go to their home or every time I, I deal with this person, they seem to have their whole life together. I open up their Facebook page and they have the perfect life, a perfect marriage with perfect children who are achieving perfect things and, and it's so perfect in their household. How can I share my burden and my challenge and my brokenness with them? We call that being slightly too sanctified. Not talking about sanctified in the sense of God's Spirit making us more like Christ. I'm talking about whitewashing and sanctifying our own lives to the appearance of others. And it makes us unapproachable because we're not real. We're not real. But our Lord Jesus Christ can never be accused of such a thing. He was absolutely real in his humanity. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. He does identify. He is real. And he really was a human. Just like you children. He had to be born, and he had to grow, and he had to, he had to learn, and go to school, and learn how to work in everything. He had to grow in stature and favor with God and man. He was real, real human. Consider the example of a four-year-old child, and maybe I used it here before, I'm not sure. But he's going to bed at night. And he's just fearful of going to bed. So fear, filled with fear. Maybe it's fear of not waking up or fear of something bad happening through the night. He's filled with this bondage of fear. And you sit next to him on his bed as a dad and you say, but son, we just prayed to God who has all things in his control. We prayed to, in the name of Jesus who's come to take away these fears. He says, as he looks at you in his face with the tears running down it, but daddy, I want someone with skin and bones. And the reality is that Jesus Christ came and he took upon himself our flesh, skin and bones. As we confessed in the forum for the Lord's Supper, he became flesh of our flesh, bone of our bones that we one day might be married in him forever. By faith, he identifies with us. A young person might come up to me, say, people are talking about me, and people are judging me. I'm worried about all their opinions. I'm under so much pressure to perform in life. I don't know where to turn. Who could I turn to? God certainly can't understand this. Or can he? 
as Jesus came to this world. His own received him and loved him and cherished him and gave him a, a palace to be born in and a palace to grow up in. And No, that's not how it went. You know the Christmas story well. He was born among his own and his own did not receive him. He was despised of men. People talked about him judged him, called him a prophet of Belial, of the devil. Maybe you think, well, Jesus don't really understand the things that I go through today because there's no social media in his day. There's no internet and there's no Instagram and Facebook and the list goes on. Everywhere I read in the Scriptures, Jesus Fame went abroad quickly. People knew about him. People talked about him. People gossiped about him. And people planned to kill him. Don't think that Jesus can't identify with you. He does. He's come to be like us. He's come to to grow and then finally to be having a, a job as a carpenter. He knows what it's like to be busy with his hands every day. He knows what it's like to have to get up to work after not having a good night's sleep. He knows what kind of busyness there is in life and, and he knows the temptations of wealth and keeping up with the Jones. As a matter of fact, that's why I read Matthew 4. The Satan takes him up onto a high mountain and he shows him the kingdoms of this world and he says, if you just bow down to me, I will give you the whole world. He knows. He knows the temptations of you in your middle age. He knows the trials of broken relationships. His own disciple betrayed him. Another denied him. Another doubted him. And all forsook him. He understands the trials of life. The afflictions, no matter if we're young or old. Because he's come to be a complete, a suitable, a sufficient Savior. To be a high priest. To be a merciful and faithful high priest. To be like his brethren. He's come and entered into this world. He's walked in the dust of this earth. He come to graves to weep with the mourners. He come to have supper with sinners and publicans. He's real in all things. Except sin. He's like his brethren. He's come to be like us. What a comfort. But secondly, he's also come for his brethren. For his brethren. He's come as a high priest, and a high priest is one who serves. Who serves. He came as a man to serve. He didn't come to be served, but to serve, he says. He might come to be that merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. And so, first of all, what a high priest was called to do is to reflect God to the people. A high priest would represent God and be clothed in, in, in all kinds of robes filled with glory and, and to portray the righteousness of God and the glory of God before the people. That was, that was one thing that the high priests were called to do. But just as importantly, the priest was to represent man before God. He was to serve man and 
direct them to God. This is why the high priest would have that ephod of gold, and, and there he had 12 stones on that ephod, and there, there the, the 12 names of the tribes of Israel were stated. And so when Christ came, He came, as it were, with that garb on and the, 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 the clothing of a high priest. And in that, He took his, the names of His people onto Himself. The names of all who would put their trust in Him. And He takes with their names the name sinner and takes our sins upon Him. And gives us white robes of righteousness. How does he do that? Well, as a high priest, he takes an offering. And he takes it into the Holy of Holies. Just as the high priest would do on the Day of Atonement. And he presents it there before his Father. What a comfort. Children, you remember what a high priest does there, don't you? The high priest would go in and he had to have a special offering, specially prepared to go into the Holy of Holies on that Day of Atonement. And if he didn't do so, just as was commanded, he would die. That's a serious thing. If anyone entered the Holy of Holies without such an offering before the justice seat of God, as it were, and the mercy seat of God, they would die. And so as he brought this offering in, what a comfort for the people knowing that they didn't have to go into the Holy of Holies, but they had a priest, a high priest, who would go and do so for them. That's what Jesus did. He goes into the Holy of Holies, and and he goes there and he presents A lamb? A ram? What did he present as a sacrifice to God? Did he present an an animal? No. Did he present the blood of an animal? No. Did he present himself as an angel? No. He presented his own flesh, the blood and the body of humanity. And he takes himself as an offering into the Holy of Holies as a high priest and it's accepted by God and on the day that he does so he rends the temple veil opening and giving access that we might have boldness to come through Jesus unto God. What an amazing, amazing truth. What a comfort. Who could stand before God without such a mediator, without such a high priest who would go and present himself as a sacrifice to God and it would be accepted and he would live? He was born to make that sacrifice as a propitiation as we heard this morning. To satisfy the wrath of God against sin because it could not have been done unless man paid the price of sin but then we realize the debt of sin is so great how could man pay that price alone it would take someone who is infinite one who is truly God as well and so Jesus Christ the suitable high priest the God man takes himself as a sacrifice to his Father in heaven with infinite value in the blood that he has shed for us, infinite value in the body he has broken for us to satisfy the holy wrath of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. He came to die as we heard this morning to free us from the curse of sin, namely death. He came. He came to us to die for us, to give us liberty, to free us from the fear of death. 
That's why Jesus was born into this world. There is one Christmas carol that puts it this way, Good Christian friends rejoice. It goes like this in verse 3. Good fr Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now you need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. The one who has created this world perfectly comes to this world in all of its brokenness and thorniness. And he comes into this sin-scarred world filled with thistles as a curse of sin. And he weaves those thistles together into a crown and that crown is placed upon his head as a payment for our sins. He comes with those arms of love and mercy and grace. Those same hands, those same hands that created the world are pierced and nailed to the cross. The feet that trod this world are nailed to the cross. The heart and the side of our Lord Jesus Christ is pierced. He come to redeem his people. He didn't do it for angels. He could have, but he didn't. He came for his people to suffer and to die. And we might know that he knows our struggles. That he knows our burdens, our afflictions. He even knows the bondage of death. Where he comes to Gethsemane. And the wrath of God is being placed upon him. And his sweat becomes like great drops of blood. And, and the, it's being pressed out of him. He knows. And he cries out to his father. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. And he goes to the cross to give us liberty. Liberty to now serve him. We think of the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Born to Set Thy People Free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in Thee. He come for His people, like His people, to be, in our third point, we see, with His brethren. Verse 18, For in that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He is able to aid those who are tempted. Sometimes we might be tempted to think that Jesus doesn't understand our temptations. That's why we read 1 John 4 at the table this afternoon. He who is greater, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And he is proclaiming there that he is able to save. He is able to give aid even in our temptations because he's made like his brethren. And he's come for his brethren to be with his brethren. But you say, but Jesus is in heaven. And certainly he says so. In John 14 he says, I must go. Because where I must go, I need to prepare a place for you. And when I... Come again, I can take you to myself and you can be with me where I am. And, and, and Jesus says, but in the meantime, I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit to dwell with you. And he's going to testify of me and, and he's going to show you of all of the things that I have taught you and they will come to your remembrance. And so when we think that Jesus doesn't understand us, he understands our needs perfectly because now he can be with all of his people at one time, he can be in us. And he can tell us, fear not, I have overcome the world. 
I have overcome temptation. Look to me. Indeed, He is like us, but we need to always remember that in some ways He is not like us, especially as we think about Jesus and the fact that He was not a sinner, that He did endure temptation and yet was sinless. But never never think that the temptations that Jesus faced were not real. So I read them for you in Matthew chapter 4. They were real. I don't know how many of you ever went two days without eating anything. Imagine going 40 days without eating anything. And as he's famished, and he's, 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 he had to be absolutely weak. As a matter of fact, after all these temptations, angels had to come to minister to him and encourage him and pick him up, as it were. But here he's, he's at, at the end of it, you would think, after 40 days, and Satan comes, but if your God just command these stones to be bread, how tempting that must have been for the Lord Jesus Christ. A real temptation in his humanity as his stomach churned with hunger, just like yours would. A real temptation. Let's never forget that. And so as a, a Savior who comes with real temptations, We can know that as a high priest, he really does understand us. He has sympathy for us, and he has compassion for us, and he has mercy on us because he understands what we're going through. He himself was tempted. Sometimes we might falsely think that because Jesus was sinless, he he wouldn't really understand how I might succumb to temptations. But that's not true at all. Our Lord Jesus Christ isn't like a bad friend who says, but, you know, it's really really your own fault that sins brought you to this point. No, He comes alongside us and, and He really sympathizes with us and has compassion on us as a merciful and faithful high priest. He actually knows far more about temptation than what we do. Because he endured it past the point that we ever have. There is no temptation that is greater than the temptations that Jesus had. And he understands them. And he redeems sinners who succumb to them. Because he liberates them. He's a personal Savior, a personal liberator. It doesn't just do it out of some kind of mechanical duty. No, it's heartfelt. It's sensitive. It's real. And He's with us. And because he's with us, let us never forget that Jesus, therefore, is able. He's able to deliver us and to save us, even from temptation. When we turn to him in spirit-worked prayer, and and he intercedes for us at the right hand of God, he's praying for his people as if you are spotless, without any sin. And he prays for us, even from the Father's right hand, as a faithful and merciful high priest. And so no wonder Paul could say, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The one who has loved me, the one who has given, given himself for me, He can know that I can do all things through Him who strengthens me in Philippians 4. Because He is with us. He is like us. And He is for us. Is that a comfort for you? I I don't know every single one of your trials. I don't know every single one of your temptations. 
I don't know every single one of your anxieties. But I know they abound. They abound among us. But what I do know is that Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest. He knows what you're going through. He understands what you're going through. He sympathizes with what you're going through. He provides escape from temptations that you're going through. And he gives strength to fight, to overcome. And he who is in you is stronger than anything that's against you. Will you not go to Jesus? Will you not be fed and nourished through the Lord's Supper today to go forth, not in your strength, but in the one who came to be like us, who came for us, and who came to be with us? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we can't comprehend such amazing truths that your care has taken, that in your care you have taken so great a thought of us that you would know us to live with us to be like us, to come to die for us, to be without any sin. You might be with us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we look around for comfort in this world. And we find there's so little comfort. There's no sympathy. There's no compassion. There's no heartfelt sensitivity to our needs and our cares. But you have shown us today that you so care for us that you have given yourself for us. You so care for us that you've given your spirit to be with us. And we pray, Lord, that we would be nourished and strengthened by your grace to not live unto ourselves, but to live by faith in the Son of God who has so loved us and given himself for us. Hear our prayer and go with us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us sing.